Hello everyone, my name is Emma and this is Learn From The Past, a channel where I geek out about cool history stuff and you hopefully learn some cool history stuff. Let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about the treatment of gay service members during World War II. So prior to World War II, the military had a rather intolerant policy toward gay service members. While there was no mechanism for outing gay service members, if a soldier was discovered to be gay, they were imprisoned without trial in a military prison. By the time these policies were re-examined in World War II, some gay prisoners had been locked up for upwards of 30 years. So why did this change in World War II? Psychiatrists. Psychiatry was a relatively new field in late 1930s, and one that wasn't taken as seriously as other medical fields. When the U.S. entered the war, psychiatrists realized that the path to legitimizing their profession was making themselves indispensable to the war effort. But how did psychiatrists decide to make themselves indispensable? Did they release reports on PTSD? Did they review medical discharges? No. Psychiatrists decided that the way to make themselves indispensable to the war effort was by outing gay soldiers. Yep. Uh-huh. Psychiatrists believed that homosexuality was a mental illness, but one that could be cured through therapy. Common medical thinking went that Everyone who's born bisexual. Some people have a gay phase. Well-adjusted people pass out of that gay phase into the normal, correct, straight phase. Those who do not stay gay because they are mentally immature. Yay. Psychiatrists convinced the military that rooting out gay soldiers attempting to enlist would be a good way to boost morale. They argued that if too many gay soldiers were discovered, they could be bullied by their peers, making it a bad time for everyone. Early in 1941, psychiatrists effectively convinced the military to give confirmed gays psychiatric treatment rather than military imprisonment. However misguided the idea of homosexuality as a mental illness, the fact that people were no longer being jailed for their sexual orientation was a good thing. Psychiatrists sorted their patients into two categories, salvageable and unsalvageable. A salvageable gay was one who had no prior history of homosexual activity, who was probably experimenting in the aggressively segregated military and would go back to a heterosexual lifestyle after the war. An unsalvageable gay was one who had a confirmed prior history of homosexual activity. Salvageable homosexuals were recommended for therapy, unsalvageable for discharge. Less than 1,000 soldiers were successfully re-enlisted under these procedures. While psychiatrists argued that these new methods were more humane than imprisonment, they also ended up outing far more gay win men and women than prior procedures, mostly because prior procedures had only affected service members caught acting on their homosexuality. These new procedures outed service members who were gay, bisexual, or questioning, even if they remained celibate while in the service. This approach also reflected the changing ideas about gayness. In the past, gayness had been an action. Now it was considered an identity. This wasn't the only issue with the new psychiatric approach to homosexuality. For homosexuality to be considered a psychiatric disorder, it had to be diagnosable. Psychiatrists argued over how to go about this, eventually settling on a series of tells, a list of stereotypical behaviors often associated with cross-gendered performance. That is effeminate behavior in men and masculine behavior in women. Another diagnostic tool was whether or not a patient appeared to be nervous during the psychiatric interview. 
none of the psychiatrists thought to consider that being interrogated might make one nervous, regardless of sexuality. While military higher-ups at first praised these anti-gay policies, they changed their minds when they began affecting recruitment numbers. The U.S. was fighting a two-front war and needed all the manpower it could muster. So in 1943, the government issued a memo stating that anti-gay policies should not be used to discharge soldiers who were performing their duties to satisfaction. This new policy, of course, allowed for too much discretion and led to the discharge of any soldier who was annoying a commanding officer. This policy was wielded most often against black soldiers who were given these blue or undesirable discharges at disproportionate rates. Despite these strict new policies, enforcement varied by unit. Units in heavy combat especially were unlikely to enforce these anti-gay discharge policies. Soldiers who saw heavy combat together were bonded and unlikely to turn on their comrades, even when they suspected that someone was gay. Also, in a life or death situation, sexuality just didn't seem as important. However, treatment of convicted gay soldiers was also harsher overseas. If a soldier was caught having sex with another, there were no U.S. prisons to put them in, so they were often stuck in tiny makeshift cells. Near the end of the war, the interrogations, imprisonments, and discharges stopped completely. Rumors abounded as to why. The most common was that someone higher up in the government noted that the policies were making it hard to keep the military staffed in a time when the U.S. desperately needed manpower. When the war ended, many people who had received blue discharges assumed that life would return to normal. It didn't. Women who had enlisted, regardless of sexuality, were seen as lesbians because they had taken on traditionally masculine roles in the military. But more than that, those with blue discharges saw them marked on their permanent records, not only outing them as gay, but also stripping them of military honors and VA benefits. Congress actually fought the VA over this policy, since the law stated that only those with dishonorable discharges could be denied benefits, but the VA renewed this anti-gay policy in 1946 and again in 1949. Soon after the war, the Pittsburgh Courier ran a series of articles on blue discharges. A disproportionate number of recipients being black, the Courier's audience had a vested interest in the issue. The Courier wrote to Congress, who established the Durham Committee to investigate the abuses of blue discharges. The Durham Committee concluded that since most blue discharge recipients had been drafted, the fact that they were dishonorably discharged just for being themselves made no sense. The committee recommended abolishing the blue discharge and giving each recipient a retroactive honorable discharge. In May of 1947, the Army started replacing most undesirable and dishonorable discharges with honorable ones, including blue discharges, at the urging of the Durham Committee. World War II had a huge effect on the LGBTQIA community in the U.S. Prior to the war, most gay people didn't know that there were other people like them. During the war, they met people from all over the country, of all walks of life, many of whom were gay. This led to a thriving gay community in post-war America, especially in big cities. Gay clubs and community organizations popped up all over New York City, which saw an influx of gay citizens after the war. Despite the expanding publicity of homosexuality in post-war society, the military retained its anti-gay stance with varying degrees of enforcement over the next few decades. In the 1980s, the restrictions hit their most restrictive, with absolutely no exceptions to blue discharges, even for valor. This no exceptions policy remained in place until it was replaced with 
Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 1993, a policy which retained discharges for gay service members but which prohibited any actions specifically geared toward outing soldiers, such as the psychiatric interviews conducted during World War II. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed in 2011, when gay service members were allowed to serve openly without fear of discharge on the grounds of their sexuality. World War II also had a huge effect on the public view of homosexuality, just as it did for service members of color and women. Gay men, traditionally thought of as too effeminate to perform the manly duties of the military, had acquitted themselves with honor during the war making it harder for the government to justify its biased policies. In fact, it was largely veterans of World War II and later the Vietnam War who played leading roles in the gay rights movements of the 1960s and 70s. Despite the many attempts to prevent them from serving, thousands of gay men and women served, fought, died, and received honors during World War II. The publicity of their service also meant that the general public could no longer pretend that gay people didn't exist. While treatment of gay service members was extremely far from ideal, the persecution actually drove the publicity and influence of gay rights in the public eye. The service of these gay soldiers was an indispensable part of the war effort, forcing the U.S. to confront the fact that gay people were here, they were just as brave and selfless and patriotic as their straight brothers in arms, and they weren't going anywhere. Thank you so much for watching. If you are interested in learning more about gay service members in World War II, or if you just want to fact check me, I have cited my sources in Chicago manual style in the description box below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and tell me what you liked about it in the comment section below. If you didn't enjoy it, give it a thumbs down and tell me what I can do to improve. If you're interested in more nerdy history content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about new videos, which I post every other Friday. Thank you for watching, and remember, those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. So don't doom yourself. I'll see you next time.